how many ways can I embarrass myself at my first FOSDEM? I can uh, apparently use a broken USB key, and then I can follow up with a Mac. Um, <laughs> So um, we're here to talk today about copyleft data and theory, uh, which we could have alternately titled, sorry, we're going to talk about it yet again. Um, and uh, so let me go through really quickly what we're going to hit on today. First, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some data copyleft while Meantime, I'm going to be loud. Um, so brief introduction, who am I? Uh, I see a lot of old faces, which is awesome. Thank you. Um, uh, oh, uh, thanks. Um, I have written way too many copyleft licenses, including uh, quite a few that were discussed. Uh, I was involved in the writing of some of the ones that were uh, mentioned in the last talk, for which I apologize. Um, I was young and stupid and didn't know any better. Um, I am now uh, the co-founder of a company called Tidelift. I'm not going to talk about Tidelift very much today, uh, but one of our goals is to uh, help uh, free software in general by helping get free software maintainers paid to do some of the boring maintenance work that otherwise they sometimes tend to ignore or that they tend to get uh, just sort of said, well, why didn't you do it? And now we'll actually have perhaps uh, some better reasons for them to do it. So um, let's talk about some numbers. Libraries.io is a, an open source project. Uh, Tidelift hired two of the maintainers, including Andrew, who's uh, down here in front. Uh, it covers uh, a wide variety of package managers, everything from the Emacs package manager to Node, uh, and lots of things in between. Covers about 2.4 million, or maybe it was 2.5 million this morning. I don't remember exactly. Uh, and it also includes dependency graphs. So one of the things that's been missing, we think, from the copyleft data discussion uh, is that when you scan all of GitHub or you scan Fedora, there's this, uh, there's this discussion of, so which are the important packages? Which are the ones that we actually care about? Right? Um, because, of course, the folks who are saying copyleft is super healthy, look at Fedora, uh, which by my count a couple weeks ago is about 55% copyleft. Uh, and Fedora is a like curated, high quality, high value set of packages. Node, with all due love for, for Node, has 600,000 packages. Perhaps not all of them are of the highest quality. Um, <laughs> and, and in fact, we know from our data analysis that some of them are literally class projects that are uploaded to Node, right? Whereas in something like Fedora or Debian, there's no such thing as that, right? Everything is of the highest value. So by using dependency information, we can see what are the top 10% most dependent on packages in Node. Uh, presumably, the class project's probably not in there. I admit I didn't check. Um, this is a graph uh, on the uh, x-axis, what's the percentage of copyleft? Uh, on the y-axis, how many packages are in this repository? These are for the repositories. Well, this is where, uh, so you, I, I forgot to mention, I actually am a lawyer, which is why I uh, apparently flip x and y axes now. Like, that's how long it's been since I did actual math. Um, on the x-axis, total number of packages, on the y number, uh, on the y axis, what percentage is copyleft? And um, you'll see that these are all, uh, that, that outlier all the way to the right is node 600 and some thousand packages. It's about, I forget the exact number, it's about 3%, uh, 3 to 4 percent copyleft. Uh, we've got one that's 80, I think that's uh, the R repository. Um, it's not very big. It's about 20,000 packages, it's about 80% copyleft. All the rest of them are clustering in this lower right-hand corner. This is uh, all the packages in our repository that have dependency information. So what if we look at the top 10%, right? Because I think, personally, there are many concerns and questions when, copy, when, uh, when uh, counting copyleft. 
Uh, but for me, the most cogent critique is this one of, but what about the curated? What about the best packages? It turns out the graph looks pretty much the same, right? Um, and the takeaway here is that the vast majority of package managers, both the average, the median, uh, all of them cluster around these numbers of 8 to 12 percent. So the next time somebody asks you what's the state of copy left in open source, um, precision of some of the counts we've seen from uh, but gives what I hope is a pretty accurate number. That's obviously let me say first, there are some caveats about the quality of that data. Um, these are uh, packages in the database from these uh, package managers with dependency information. We know at least a license, might not be 100% accurate, um, but we know a license from about 79% of them. We know no license information at all from 14%. And from 7% of them, uh, believe in copyleft. Um, I was told last night at dinner, I think that nobody believes in copyleft anymore. Um, I'm here to tell you that that's not actually true. Um, uh, and I think there's three reasons, and these are, uh, I think, often historically treated as different reasons to support copyleft. I think it's important to understand that they overlap. So there, um, there are folks, uh, you know, often associ associated with the FSF, but not entirely, uh, who believe that the copylefts are important because of freedom. Uh, I, you know, I'm not going to belabor this to this audience because you all know most of this. Um, you know, quality. This is sort of traditionally the OSI associated thing. If we open the code, it will be better, and so copylefts are good at opening the code. And there's a third one, which I think is somewhat sometimes underappreciated, which is if we copyleft this code, we are encouraging people to share back with us. Right? We are getting these contributions, and we are preventing free riding. Uh, and it's important, I think, to understand. Uh, again, in a discussion last night, someone told me. Uh, someone who has sometimes been publicly skeptical of, uh, Linux, uh, of Linux and Linus um, mentioned that the Linux kernel was clearly and obviously the greatest success of copyleft licensing. And it was interesting because this person is definitely in camp number one. They're all about the freedom. Linus himself, to the extent he ever indicates that he cares at all, is in camp number three. And yet, Linus's action by trying to solve his needs under camp number three, uh, increased freedom in a really important and tangible way. Uh, all of these reasons are still relevant. They're still valid. Uh, and yet, we've gone from 55% in Fedora to 10% now. And so what happened? Why are we only at 10%? Before we get to some theories about why we're only getting to 10%, I assume most of you know that perhaps the most dominant theory of why are we where we are um, is that, oh, developers hate copyleft, or companies hate copyleft, or take your pick of any number of people who supposedly hate copyleft. So after my child was born, uh, a couple of years back, I uh, left the Wikimedia Foundation, and I spent a couple of years uh, serving as the outside legal counsel to many of the biggest companies in Silicon Valley. Uh, and these folks are supposedly the leading cutting edge of, oh my god, copyleft is the worst. Um, now, it is true that quite a few of them, in fact, their official corporate position is copyleft is the worst. Um, however, uh, it really surprised me the number of them that um, did not hate copyleft. 
more than one of them said to me, uh, yeah, I would actually love to use a license that uh, when I'm doing software as a service actually encourages my competitors to actually share code with me. They specifically cited, hey, copyleft sounds good because it's going to encourage people to contribute. They're definitely not in the freedom game, um, but they are still in the copyleft game, at least in theory. Here's the problem. Then I was like, well, uh, you want a software as a service copyleft? AGPL or AGPL or AGPL. And then their faces turned white. And I mean, it's Silicon Valley, so their faces sadly were mostly already white. Um, <laughs> And, um, uh, and it's funny, for we don't get out much. Um, and uh, yeah, and their interest in copyleft was not high enough to overcome the complexity of AGPL, the, um, uh, I would say, the ambiguity of AGPL. Um, they really were interested, and AGPL really didn't solve their problem. It's not just these big companies that I talk to that are frustrated, of course. Any of you who follow other people in free software or in open source on Twitter will have seen an increase in the past uh, couple of years about, um, oh my god, why are people so rude to me in my issue tracker? Why are people so inconsiderate? I'm doing this for free. Why, you know, but why am I doing this to myself? Um, and the desire, again, for copyleft has not gone away, right? Um, these folks also want contribution. They want participation. And so even if, in fact, they don't believe that copyleft leads to freedom, even if they don't believe that copyleft leads to greater utility, there's still, I think, quite a bit of desire amongst the developers for copylefts that actually help with the contribution problem. The problem is our current licenses do none of these things. This feels to me like a solvable problem. AGPL is not fundamentally broken. It is pretty darn hard to read, though. Um, and uh, it has an FAQ that's not very helpful. Um, we've got to try to fix it. And that's where I think I come from with my frustration right now. Uh, and in fact, again, I bear part of the blame as a former board member of the Open Source Initiative. If you'd asked me the question five years ago, what do you think about proliferation? The answer would have been proliferation bad, fewer licenses, we need to streamline more, we need to streamline more. And that answer I think has, well, um, like, <laughs> Um, uh, it's fine. Um, like the computer, the progress of licensing has stopped. Um, and uh, we, uh, we've found ourselves in a situation, and the, and the software industry has not stopped. Right? In the past 20 years, we went from a world for, where almost all software was distributed to end users to a world where the vast majority of the world's most valuable software uh, is distributed as services. Uh, big data is huge and never distributed. Machine learning is huge and very rarely, if ever, distributed. And that's not for nefarious reasons, often. Not always. But uh, it's not for nefarious reasons. It's not like, oh, uh, you know, we hate you, it's just, it turns out you don't have a million cores handy, and so this machine learning code is probably not actually that helpful to you. Um, and so what I want to transition to in the last part of the talk, uh, in slides that are th thankfully brief, um, is a, a plea for us, for those of us in the room who are lawyers, to think again about not just licenses, but also as in the previous talk, contracts, other legal forms, what can we do to create the effect of copyleft, to create more freedom, to create better utility, to create better cooperation, um, that might mean, that might be something as simple as AGPL 3.1. It might even be as simple as a new AGPL FAQ uh, for at least some of the worst problems of AGPL's confusion. Um, it might be a lesser AGPL. That's something that I think a lot of people in the room have had ideas about. Uh, it might be things like, uh, some of you may have seen recently something called License Zero. It's an attempt to rethink copyleft in the commercial context. Uh, I don't know if it's a great license, but it's an idea that really pokes and prods a lot of our intuitions about what a license should be. 
Uh, similarly, there's a project called, and this is where my slides would be useful, uh, called the uh, uh, called the Civic Data Trust. Uh, the Civic Data Trust is an is an uh, is an attempt to say, you know what? Actually, maybe copyright licenses aren't the right tool for this job. Maybe we should be using alternative legal forms like trusts and contracts in order to experiment with things that reach the same goal, that have us, again, working better with each other, not hoarding our code, sharing our patches with a little bit of nudge from the legal system. Right? Um, and so my plea to you as lawyers in the room is to think creatively to the next time someone you know who's on the OSI board uh, tells you not to write a new license, ignore them. Go, seize your joy, write that new license. Um, you know you want to. Just, just don't name it after your company. Um, uh, and for those of you who are developers, uh, I urge you to think again about what your options are. Uh, it's in fact not true that just because you choose a copyleft license, no one is going to use your code. It's true not everyone will, but definitely some people will. And you might find yourself as the next Linus, not just because you wrote an awesome piece of code that everybody uses, uh, but because you wrote an awesome piece of code that encourages people to give and to rethink what they thought they knew about licensing. Uh, on that note, I will stop my ranting, uh, close my embarrassing Mac laptop, and uh, call for questions. Uh, or just, you know, spitballs. Um, do I get to... Uh, uh, audience vote, should I prioritize questions from the institutions I've just insulted or, or, or accidentally slighted? Uh, um, I, I, actually, I'm going to start with. So for those of you who couldn't hear, uh, uh, Bradley said, uh, called me out on saying lawyers. I, I believe my uh, slides actually say legal nerds um, because, uh, because I do think some of the creativity here uh, can definitely come from outside of the lawyers, right? We can help you identify tools, um, but ultimately we can't feel the pain of failed cooperation because we're not the ones doing it. So I, I totally agree with you, Bradley. It shouldn't just be up to the lawyers. Um, and I certainly, you know, I would hope that those of us who are lawyers uh, can help support those uh, in a way that's constructive and not just destructive as we, uh, as you're correct to point out, we sometimes have been. Um, so that's one institution I may have accidentally slighted. Uh, second institution? So, uh, so the question, uh, so the question is, uh, why is eight to twelve percent bad? Is are what am I measuring that against? Um, so, the initial draft of this slide deck said, I am not making any judgment. I'm just telling you, it's eight to twelve percent. I realized that was a lie, um, so I took out that. Uh, I, I think the, I, I think the, I, I was comparing it by reference to Fedora. Like I said, I did a scan of Fedora 27. Uh, a couple of weeks ago of the complete repository, 44,000 packages or so. Uh, that is not part of libraries.io because for various reasons it doesn't do the core operating system, but uh, if you want to submit a patch to libraries.io to make it handle the core operating system, Andrew's right there. Um, uh, that code, by the way, AGPL. Um, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, I think compared to what we think of as the golden age of copyleft, where there was more uh, how to put it, certainly, you know, I come from a far enough back age where, like, my first piece of software that I ever released 
uh, was under a copyleft license because I believed that that would uh, encourage contribution, right? And like ultimately at some level I still do. Uh, and so uh, my judgment call is I think we're a little bit worse off if the world has gone from where Fedora Debian used to be the most dominant package managers and were predominantly copyleft. And we've now gone to a world where most package managers are far and away vastly permissive. Um, and by the way, I didn't mention uh, those 8 to 12 numbers are about one half. It, it depends a lot varying on that. There's more variance in that number. But it's about, overall, it's about half weak copy left, about half strong copy left, and network copy left is a rounding error. Hope that, James, or? The man with the bow tie, sorry, Dave. Yeah, so James mentions that, a, uh, that Silicon Valley should be interested in copyleft licenses because of the much stronger patent language that is typically contained uh, in, uh, in copyleft licenses. I think I agree with that, though I think that's to some extent a flaw of history. Um, there are, as some of you may know, Intel and Oracle have both, uh, well, an Intel employee uh, and Oracle have uh, both published very permissive licenses with very strong uh, patent grants, though not necessarily patent terminations. Uh, so I don't think that's quite as clear as it once was, but. Uh, yes, yes, right, uh, right. Uh, so I, I see, so, and yes, and so the other uh, part of that is that if you, if you put your patents under a permissive license, they can go all over the place, whereas if you put your patents under a copyleft license, you retain some uh, control, some visibility, uh, and the scope of the spread of those patents may be limited, which, I, which is definitely correct, though that's not one I would be super, it's one I would tell one of my clients, uh, because I'm supposed to tell them the full spectrum of solutions, uh, but as a free software advocate, I'm of mixed opinions about it. I, I think I, we're I, now done. I'd love to have more discussion, but we're out of time, and I'd encourage you to grab Lewis and go to the hallway track or, or, or stalk him online. Thank you. Thank you.